Good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. How's it going today? Today we're going to talk about effective practice. We're going to talk about pushing through those plateaus and we are going to talk about just trying to get better and how to get better. So first of all, let's do a a little bit of a sound check because... Uh, been tripped up with that before so let's just pop something in the chat today here we go and then we'll get started all right so let's go a little bit here i'll put some new strings on my martin Yesterday, I've, I've really neglected that guitar. It's, um, it doesn't get a lot of play because I just don't play acoustic guitar that much. But I've got a, a gig coming up with um, a kind of singer-songwriter. She plays a lot of acoustic stuff. And so had to whip out some new strings for that one. Okay. So... You're here in the right place if you are trying to figure out what's the best practice routine for you, you know, what's best use of your time. And, uh, you know, what to do when you get time with your guitar. What should you be doing? What shouldn't you be doing? And I can only talk to you about my, my kind of um, opinion on things. There's a lot of opinions out there, but... I think um, the first thing to say is that none of this works if you don't have the discipline. Oh, thank you, Joe. I appreciate, I appreciate the feedback there. Uh, <laughs> I have started previous live streams completely silent and nobody's told me. So thank you for chipping in there. So point number one, regardless of what you're going to practice, what you what you're currently focusing on, none of this works without discipline. And I, I can't really help you with that. I can only make suggestions. But if you've one of those people who does everything for two minutes and then moves on to the next thing and then does something else for two minutes, it's just you're never going to get good at anything. You're going to get bad at everything. All right. So the best use of your time demands some discipline and some focus. But I think, you know, when you when you plan your practice you need to plan it in with two components there needs to be learning and there needs to be fun okay we play guitar because it makes us feel good it's fun right and if the fun bit's not there then we practice less we feel it's a bit of a chore we you know but we don't pick it up for a week or two oh i've got to learn this so you need the two components and i always say we'll do the learning first and then the fun because during the learning time, even if you're getting a bit antsy and bored, you know you've got the fun bit to look forward to. And the fun bit could just be simply jamming to a backing track or whatever it is you like to play your favourite song or playing your favourite licks. But there has to be those two components for it to be enjoyable for you and also to be useful for you because you've got the learning component in all of those. So... I want to talk about 
Goals. I know a lot of people talk about goals and, oh, well, how do you design a practice? Because a lot of people I see posting on forums and things, they want to know what to practice and when. And it's really, that's such a difficult thing to answer if you don't know that person and what they're trying to do on the guitar, what stuff they're into, how long they've been playing. So it's very specific to the to the individual. But you know what you like to play and you know what stuff you'd like to do. So just put three things on a list, okay? One of the things I wanted to do a few years ago was to improve my picking because I wasn't happy with it and I knew it could be better, especially when you see some dudes on YouTube just shredding it. So that was one of the things I did. Okay, I want to get better at picking. And if you want to get better at picking, write it down. I want to get better at picking is a good first start, but it's not specific enough there. It's just not. You need to go, okay, I want to improve my alternate picking right now. And this is where my next point come in. Right now, I'm at 80 BPM. Just I'm really struggling with doing, you know, 16th notes at 80 BPM. My goal is to be doing them at, I don't know, 150 BPM. And I'd like to do that. I'd like to achieve that within the next two months. So what we've got there, we've talked about a goal, then we've made it really specific. What we've also done is included a benchmark in there. You said, okay, right now I can pick at this speed. There's your benchmark. And then you've given yourself a target of role. I want to improve that speed to 150. And then you've given yourself a timeline to do it in. You know, we do it in lots of other areas of life and work and stuff like that. So just writing down something, or setting a goal and giving yourself a time and giving yourself where you are now and where you want to be. Um, I don't know why guitarists don't tend to do that. I think just we're, we're kind of lazy. We're like the lazy musicians. Everybody else is working really hard, the violinists and the saxophonists and all of those. I don't know what you think about that, but we're always looking for some shortcut or some way to instantly do this without doing any of the work. But you have to put in the work. Nobody got good by not doing the work. There's no matrix plugging where you just like unplug this bit and you put in this chip and suddenly, you know, you're Joe Satriani or you're John Mayer. You have to do the hard yards, right? So set some goals, um, set some benchmarks and set yourself a, a time limit. Now be realistic with your time limit. In fact, be, be kind of, give yourself more time than you need. I think is fair because again it fights that compulsion of yeah i want to do i want to do this 180 bpm downstrokes um by next week yeah, that's, that's not really very realistic and if you don't hit it then you're going to feel demotivated because you didn't hit that goal so give yourself more time than you think you need because quite typically we tend to us underestimate how long it takes okay The thing that I like to do is to document my progress, okay? And I don't do anything more complicated than record stuff I do, either with my phone, okay, so I can see my own hands, or I just use the like the audio um, note thing on my phone just to record the audio. But either way, it's a simple thing to do, and it comes in very handy later on. I also, particularly if I'm working on a specific goal like picking, I keep a spreadsheet. It's a little bit nerdy, I know, but I can put the date, I can put the exercise that I'm doing, the picking exercise. I can put in the BPM and I can put in any kind of comments about what I notice. For example, I don't know, like the second beat of the bar is tricky with the string change or I keep on missing that third string or, you know, something that you experience when you're doing it, that you're not actually doing it quite correctly. You can feel those things, but you don't often document what you're thinking. You just go, oh, I've stuffed that up. It's not really working. Like, oh, I kind of, after this amount of speed, it just gets messy. Write those things down in the spreadsheet, okay? And then over time, you can see the BPM go up. You can see how you were aware of certain issues and whether those issues are still there. 
Um, and you can see the progress and you can see what how long it took you realistically to solve it. And that's the other thing about keeping a kind of journal or a spreadsheet or however you want to record what you're doing. It's super important that you you have that body of work for, for several reasons. The first one is you can see how long it actually took versus how long you thought it was going to take. OK, and over time, you know, if you've got several goals and you thought all of them would take a month and they've all taken two months, then you can adjust your expectations for when you set next your next goal. The other thing it's really important for is those times when you feel like you're just not getting any better. And I want to talk about that because it's a big thing, the plateaus, the struggles. I don't know about you, Joe. But it's something that bothers all of us, regardless of whether we're beginners, intermediates, advanced people or rock stars. We all have this same feeling about how we're playing. Sometimes we feel good about it and we feel like we're moving forward and we're having like an awesome time. And there's a, maybe a eureka moment and we're like, yes, I nailed it. And you're like amped. And then that eventually like everything, it fades over time until you get to a point where you're like, oh man, I just suck at this today. I'm not getting faster. I'm not getting cleaner. I just don't know what's wrong. And we go through this. And it's important to understand with plateaus and, and the difficult times that you have, it's a cycle. It's, it's seasonal, right? It goes around and it comes around. So the time where you're feeling awesome because you've had an amazing breakthrough, okay, that lasts for, for some time and then it fades, okay? And then we're back to not feeling like we're really getting better and then we're kind of, oh, it's been ages since I feel like I've gotten better and I'm not getting any better and this is taking ages and everybody else is getting better than me and I suck. I should think about giving up or I just don't want to pick up the guitar today or whatever, all right? And it's this, this low point that, people put down their instrument and they avoid it. They avoid facing that feeling because it's not nice. But you have to understand that this is a circle, right? Okay, so when you're down here, you need to know that actually there's there's only this much to the next breakthrough. But you might be kind of spinning your wheels for a bit um, until you get there. Joe says, my playing is better when I'm alone. Huh, that's interesting. I get a lot of people tell me that. I find myself making silly mistakes when I play in front of others. Yeah, I've got um, a student I teach. He's um, he flies planes for a living. He's a pilot. He flies, you know, passenger jets to all over the world. And he says he gets scared when he needs to play in front of you know people like just his friends and you know not not like on stage in front of people, but just maybe his wife or his buddies, and he he has a problem with it. He, he kind of, he's always apologetic going, oh, I'm usually better than this when I'm alone. And I'm saying, dude, you, you land planes with hundreds of people on board. You have literally their lives in your hands. It can't be as scary as that. But from a perception point of view, yeah, a lot of people have that thing. And I think it's just, a, it's just a self-consciousness. You know, you want to, you want to impress them. You want to feel comfortable. And, but I think you just need to keep on doing it and put yourself in those situations until it becomes more manageable because those things never, I don't know if they ever get easy playing in front of people. I mean, it gets easier, but um, it certainly gets easy for you, like your, your close group of friends or your, your loved ones. But if you're on stage, I don't know if it ever gets to a point where you just, ah, I don't really care. I'm completely fine. I'm not nervous. I'm not going to make any mistakes because we're all human. Okay. We stand in front of 50 people or 5,000 people or 50,000 people. It's the same thing. You're anxious because you care. You care about delivering something that those people have come to see, whether they paid dollars or, or, or not. But I think, Joe, you need to just just keep doing it and give yourself a break. You know, you're only human. 
humans make mistakes. Just kind of laugh at it and move on. Don't don't beat yourself up about it. Unless, of course, you haven't practiced and somebody asks you to play something and you're like, yeah, I can do that. Um, and you know you haven't practiced and then kind of that's your own fault, right? Larry Mitchell, and he plays effortlessly. Yeah, he really does. And that's the thing with most of these guys. You know, unlike you and me, these guys have had eight or nine hours a day for for many years, maybe many decades, to hone their craft. Okay, I don't have that kind of time anymore. I used to. Okay, when I was a student, I probably had had that kind of time to just play and play and play and play. But now I don't. So I think you have to look at it like, especially comparing yourself to other people, and you look at them and they're like they they don't even blink it's just there for them that's what you see but what you didn't see is them you know practicing that for a decade to get comfortable and i was saying this last week in the live stream that there's there's a kind of three phases of learning something there's the phase of actually you don't know it and you're learning it then the second phase is practicing what you've learned but there's a a third phase which doesn't really get talked about and that is this playing in phase which is that thing you're talking about joe which is going between being really focused and concentrating on on playing what you have learned moving that to a place where you're not concentrating or you don't need to concentrate as much on playing what you've learned because you've played it in you've played it so many times that actually now you're not chasing it you're just, you know where things are. And you don't need to panic about, oh, well, I need to shift position here. Do I need to go to the 12th fret from the 8th fret? You know, you just, you just move in there. Okay, there's a thing I use called net positive practice, which is not the learning part, but the practicing part. Once you've learned something, the practicing thing that helps me is I keep a checklist, okay? It's, again... It's necessary for me because when I go out and play shows with people, they do expect me to get it as right as I can. And obviously, I want to feel like I've done as much as I can to make that happen for them as well. So I keep a checklist and my checklist is basically how many times did I play this particular piece? It could be a lick. It could be a, a chorus of a song. It could be an entire song. But usually it's, it's smaller chunks. If I play it through and I make a mistake, I have to stop, I have to slow it down, and I have to right that wrong by playing it correctly at least three times, usually five times correctly in a row. My thinking is like when you are playing something, your brain is on record it is recording what you're doing to store it again as another memory if you make a mistake your brain has recorded that mistake and to kind of overwrite that mistake or erase that mistake you have to overwrite it with new correct information and for that new correct information to be stronger than the mistake you just made that you played once you need to play it correctly three, four, five times in a row. So you've kind of completely solidified and papered over the cracks of that mistake. And now you put something else on top of it. So every time I make a mistake, that's that's what I do. I slow down and try and play it correctly three to five times. If I make another mistake, then I start again and try and play it correctly three to five times. Usually mistakes come just between interruptions of the messages between the brain and the fingers. And 99% of the time, that's because you're playing it too fast for you to think, okay? Fingers wanna go faster. I know everybody wants to go faster than they really wanna do. I tell my students all the time, I'm never gonna be impressed with your speed. I'm only gonna be impressed with your clarity. And clarity takes time. And you need time to think, so your tempo needs to be slower. It's almost always half the tempo that they think they should be playing at. I don't know whether they just want to impress me as their teacher or what, but you got to go slow 
so the brain has enough time to talk to the fingers. If the brain doesn't have enough time, then the fingers start making up their own stuff and they get it wrong. So <laughs> net positive practice will, will help. Definitely get it right. Now, let's talk about topics. What should you include in your practice? Well, only you know what you want to be working on. So that is a personal thing. But I think every practice generally should include these elements. It should include some technique. OK, so picking, strumming, whatever that you need to work on. Number two is timing. You should always be playing with some kind of timekeeping device. It could be a metronome, but I know a lot of people don't get on with metronomes. So a drum groove or a backing track is also just as valid. As long as it's got a solid, steady beat that will keep you honest, because I, I've met a lot of guitarists who say their timing is great, but they've never really practiced with a metronome. And when you put them to a metronome, it's not great at all. <laughs> okay, you can't lie to yourself if you're not in time. It's obvious. So technique is one, timing is two, ear training is number three. And I did talk about this a bit last week also. It's one of the things I think is missing in people's guitar practice because they're not listening to things and trying to work them out anymore because we can just Google it. We can get a tab. We can find a YouTube lesson on it. And that's really beneficial if you've got 60 songs to learn by next Saturday because you've been commissioned to play a show. But those shortcuts are affecting the development of this, which when it comes to creating your own music and working out stuff is, is vitally important. Developing your own mind's ear, as it were, is really important. So taking some time to work something out by ear, it could be a short melody, it could be a couple of chords, but listening to it and not Googling it, using the tab, not using anything else apart from your ear and the play and pause button. And maybe, you know, a pen and paper if you want to write it down and transcribe it. That is worth doing. It's worth doing today. It's worth starting now because the more you do it, the easier it gets, the faster you'll get things. If you need to work out stuff, you go, ah, oh, I kind of, I know where this is going to go. So ear training, definitely. Number four, song learning. Increasing your repertoire, songs that you love, songs that you've been asked to play with other people or songs that maybe you're just interested in, even if they're too technically challenged for you to do them, you should definitely learn songs. Because a good, just a good understanding, it's like having a lexicon of language. If you go to Spain or something, you know, if you know lots of Spanish phrases, you can communicate with lots of Spanish people, right? But if you only know three phrases, it's going to be tough for you. So that's kind of the same with songs. Joe, yeah, tabs aren't always accurate. It's absolutely right. Um, in fact, I'd say most tabs aren't accurate because they're in that little kind of, you know, typewriter kind of thing. There's a couple of dashes and then there's, there's not proper, proper transcribe stuff. Not like, um, not like these kind of books. This is, this is my signed Joe Satriani flying in a blue dream transcription. But, you know, these, these are transcribed by people who know what they're doing. But, you know. People don't buy books anymore, right? Um, you get a tab. It's, it's just somebody's opinion, okay? <clears throat> Unless the original artist has trans transcribed what they did, which never really happens. It's somebody's opinion about where those notes were played and how those notes were played. Some people have got really good ears and then they put together books like that and you pay dollars for them. But a lot of, a lot of times it's just, you know, a person like you or me goes, oh, yeah, I can figure that out. And then they put it in there and sometimes they nail it. But there's a lot of tab out there. They don't nail it at all. So that's why I trust my own ears. OK, I regularly transcribe things, not entire songs, but there might be solos or some licks or short pieces. Um, Because that's how we develop this ear. The shortcuts of getting tabs so you can play a song. Totally great if you just want to get started but that's the end product of a process. And that process to develop your inner ear 
and begin hearing what you're playing and playing what you're hearing starts with ear training. So just to recap, number one is technique. Number two is timing. Number three is ear training. Number four is song learning. So increasing your repertoire. It doesn't have to be super hard songs, just song songs. And number five is theory. Now, bite-sized pieces of theory, okay? Not, not pages and pages of the stuff because there's quite a lot of theory that you can learn about music that's not necessarily applicable to guitar. Uh, and some of it can be a bit intimidating. So that's why I say bite-sized pieces. And I think also when you learn theory is as important as learning theory, because if you learn theory as an abstract thing, first like say you've never picked up the guitar before and you learn about scales and arpeggios that might freak you out okay but if you learn a scale first and then within the scale you can see or notice some arpeggios in that scale shape then that bit of theory helps um validate and help you understand what you've learned on the fretboard um in, in a practical sense so bite-sized pieces. So those are my five things I think every practice should include. Um, now, what I was gonna say, we were talking about plateaus and I said that it's cyclic. We feel awesome, we have a breakthrough, we come back, it fades, we don't feel that great, then we get demotivated. You've gotta hang in there. You've gotta understand that it's a circle and it's coming around again, okay? But you do feel like you're swading through some mud and you're not progressing. And this is where the recording and documenting of your practice or one of your goal pieces or all of your goal pieces, but just, you know, one minute clip of you playing, do it every practice. And then you've got a bunch of clips. Now, this is where this comes in very useful because in you've got basically the facts and then you've got what the voice in your head tells you and when we're in that demotivated state we don't feel we're getting any better that's when that voice takes over and it's like oh man you suck you're never going to get better have you seen jake play lately we started at the same time and now he's ripping it up and i'm still struggling and all this stuff starts popping out of the woodwork and basically telling you reasons why you shouldn't continue or why you're not progressing. Now, go back and look at the footage because you might feel that you've been working on this for two weeks and you're just not progressing at all. The truth is, if you're practicing it, you are progressing, but it might be one of those micro improvements that your fingers are getting used to, the pick angle, the way you move across the strings, whatever it is you're not really conscious of those things coming together because they are coming together slowly and you need to do thousands of repetitions. But if you go, if you're feeling like on day 14 that you're no better than you were on day one, go and look at day 13's video and then go and look at day one's video. And that's the proof. I guarantee you would have improved. It, not, it might not be, you might not be amazing, to like from terrible to amazing, but you will have moved forward. And that is why I use those factual documents of my playing to quieten the voices in my head, the voices of doubt, the ones that, you know, can mess with your head. It's all a mind game. And you can just, you know, kick them in the balls and steal their lunch money because they ain't got no place. What they're saying is completely untrue. You have improved. You might not have improved as much as you'd hoped, but you are moving forward. And it's so simple to do. Everyone's got a smartphone with video or audio. There's no, there's no excuse not to be doing that. Again, I said, none of this is gonna work if you don't have discipline. And the discipline to press record and to do that every time you have a practice, um, you know, it's, I don't think it's a big ask, but you might forget to do it. You just need to get into a habit. I don't know why every live stream I've done so far, I managed to drop my pick. Okay. Also, I use my phone 
when I'm practicing something, I put the countdown timer on and I will do things like I practice this thing for five minutes or whatever it is. And again, the phone and the countdown timer, it keeps me honest about what I'm doing. Because sometimes I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll spend five minutes on this and I'm playing away. And then I go, oh, yeah, that'll do. that's about five minutes. And it's probably not. It's probably about two minutes because I want to get onto some fun stuff, right? But having a countdown timer means, again, it keeps you honest. It keeps you factual. Yes, I spent actually five minutes doing that particular thing. There's a couple of other things. Joe, did you have any questions? Does anybody else have any questions? I want to talk about one more thing. And uh, if you've got any questions about stuff, then pop it in the chat, please. Um, I also designate some periods for conscious practice and others to unconscious practice. Um, all right, you're just absorbing info. OK, no problem. Um, conscious practice is kind of obviously when you are consciously practicing, I need to do this. You know, when you focused on a particular task. Unconscious practice is stuff you do, the guitar practice you do, but while you're doing other things like watching TV or, geez, I don't know. Well, for watching TV is probably the main one, but something else. And you might just be, you learn a new chord shape, okay? And all you're going to do is kind of, we're going to do this chord shape and then we're going to take our fingers off the fretboard. And then you're going to try and find that chord shape again. And then you're going to take your fingers off. Now, conscious practice, you'll be, you'll be, you know, you'll be doing okay. Taking your fingers off and focusing. And then when you're watching TV, you just, sit there in the chair you know and just just take your fingers off try and put your fingers on you're not really concentrating on what you're doing you're unconsciously just making these movements taking them off putting them on and also maybe before you do that you don't have to take them off and put them on you could just leave them there and squeeze gently and then unsqueeze and then squeeze and unsqueeze so your fingers kind of, they get to know each other. They get to know, you know, pinky finger gets to understand that for this particular shape, pinky finger can feel on the side of it that um, ring finger is touching it. So that, you know, they start to understand whether it's like that chord shape, you know, you might do that. And then for pinky fingers, not even got any friends to cuddle him, right? <laughs> or this time he has, depending on the shape. So you're giving information to your body parts without really kind of being conscious. And that's also super interesting to help because there's an unconscious part of it and there's a conscious part of it. And unconscious practice is, is useful. You know, don't, um, you have to do both, okay? <laughs> don't think you can just get away with sitting there in front of the TV holding a chord shape because that, that's no good. That's not playing, that's not practicing guitar unless you're doing the conscious practice of that chord shape as well okay so there's you have to do the work there are no shortcuts but yeah doing stuff in front of the tv it, it just for me it helps build a bridge somewhere between the unconscious and the conscious um so i would definitely definitely recommend doing that now speaking of unconscious one of the things I talked about last week was um, I coined a phrase and I copyrighted it. Um, I called it li-fi. <clears throat> not Wi-Fi or not hi-fi, but li-fi. Li-fi stands for last input, first input. And what that means is basically, <coughs> excuse me, making sure that if you're learning something, Make that something that you're learning the last thing you do before you go to bed. Okay, so it's the last input signal to the brain in terms of absorbing and recording. Then go to sleep, wake up the next morning, and then before you do yoga or make your coffee or whatever it is you do in the morning, go straight to your guitar and make it the first input signal. 
that I have found, particularly when it comes to learning lots of songs and, and ironing out some of the, the bumps in it, is very useful. It leverages the subconscious because during your sleep, your subconscious strengthens the neural pathways of memories you've had during the day. It's when the brain does its processing, okay? Or at least a lot of its processing. So having that as the last thing means it goes in and then having it as the first thing, it means it helps solidify those things. So give that a go. I super recommend that technique, Li-Fi. You don't have to call it Li-Fi. I just thought it was cool to give it a cool name. I don't know if it's cool, but that's what I do. Last thing at night, first thing in the morning. And over a period of weeks, it's, it really helps. Not to say I don't do conscious practice during the day as well, but that I know a lot of people who also swear by that. They might call it something different. But yeah, sleeping on something is it's when your brain makes the memories and solidifies the memories. So hitting it first thing, last thing is always beneficial. Now, I wanted to talk about shiny object syndrome because we totally have all these different things we could be learning in front of us, you know, recommended videos on Google, uh, YouTube. There's a ton of stuff and most of it's really good these days with people who are an ama amazing like Rick Beato or guys like this who just, you know, they're huge wealth of knowledge and insight. But what do we what do we do? Where do we start? How are we not overwhelmed by all of this stuff coming at us? Well, we're of course, we're always overwhelmed because that's just the world we live in right now. Everything is everything's flying at us all the time. But again, I like go back to my original point. Nothing, nothing works that I've talked about today without discipline. So the self-discipline is to stop yourself from spending two minutes with something and then going, oh, that looks cool. Click. And then you were, oh, yeah, I'm bored of this five minutes thing. Oh, let's go with something else. You've got to stop that because you'll just be half assing everything and not getting good at anything. So the real skill, I think the real skill is going narrow and deep. Okay, pick one thing and work at it. And you might pick three things and work at them because, you know, one thing might be a bit laborious. But if you put focused time and energy on one thing for a period of time, it's way more beneficial to you than if you just do like a minute of that and then a minute of this or two minutes of that. You've got to stick with it. And we're impatient. We are. And there's lots of things vying for our attention. And also we get that kind of uh, restlessness. It's just the way we we are and our relationship with technology and, you know, things pinging and you got new Instagram like or you got a new Facebook message or, you know, somebody somewhere made something that alerted you to the fact that they did it. It means you're in a constant state of only half concentrating on everything. So if, you, if you're going to practice, you're going to use your phone for recording or whatever but make sure you've got messenger turned off and all your notifications and all that stuff because it's just distraction and it's interruption and you need to kind of get some pace you need to spend some uninterrupted time it's not the fact you're doing it it's a fact it's the fact you maybe did it for half an hour or 10 minutes or uninterrupted focused time narrow and deep start with one thing or, you know, a, a selection of single things, but don't don't make it 20 things and stop stop pressing the next button. There's a great little. Um... Great little lick that um, Guthrie Trap does, which that's a terrible replication of. Um, but that's something. 
I thought was cool that I'm I'm working on at the moment. Just working on the smoothness of it. It's in G. And you can find it on um, his channel. I think it's um, Show Me That Lick. Show Me That I think it's... Um, anyway, you'll find it on YouTube. Show Me That Lick. But it's... So it works nicely over that G7. But Guthrie's kind of doing like, you know, super cool because he's a super cool guy. One of the things I notice about this lick is that when I'm practicing it, I need to get the pick directions right because that affects the phrasing and also whether I play it cleanly. So there's like, there's one, two, three, four, five notes. Five notes on the first string. And if you're doing alternate picking, starting with a downstroke, if you do actually pick five notes, down, up, down, up, down, it means you've made a downstroke on the top string. And then the next part of the phrase is on the second string. So then you're kind of stuffed because you've just finished a downstroke and you're kind of over here and you kind of need to be placed to play the second string. Okay, so. An awareness of picking direction. Joe, Joe um, Guthrie's awesome. I use the side of my pick based on his recommendation. Yeah, the guy's just incredible. I mean, we're so lucky to have access to these dudes these days. You know, it's they're they're just one step away. They're just it's just great. It's kind of like they're in our living room. You know, you get to see and hear exactly what they're doing and what they're doing now and how they got to that point and stories. I think it's awesome. So back to this lick. That lick has five pick strokes and I don't want to end up with a downstroke on the first string. I need to get to where I can start the lick with a downstroke when it transitions to the second string. So the first thing I noticed about that was I need to leave out a pick stroke. So I go down, up, down, up, and then slur it, slide it down, but don't pick it. So that my last pick stroke was an upstroke. And so I can use that motion to then move myself to the second string for the downstroke for the next part of the lick. Now the next part of the lick is four notes. So if I start with a downstroke, then I've got down, up, down, up, which is fine because I end with an upstroke. And that's what I want to do when I move to my next string. So I'm going from the top, I'm going down, up, down, up, slide, down, up, down, up. And then I've got the last three notes, down, up. And then I could do a down. And I could do it down here because the next part of that lick is on the same string. So I don't need to be ending on an upstroke for there. And I think I do do that. I think I... <laughs> yeah, so I do end up with a downstroke the second time and actually start the that third phrase. Right to... Start this phrase with an upstroke. So I'm just talking about that lick in particular because that's something I think is fun. I like the way it works. So I'm kind of using it as one of my goal benchmarks. You can, you can hear and you can see that I'm not all that right now, but um, that's one of the things I'm going to focus on. And it's just because I like that lick. Okay. And it doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. You, you can like a lick and you go, okay. I'm just going to work on this until I get it right, until I get the feel of it right, until I get the tempo right. And and that's how, how we go about setting those goals. Camille, I'm having an issue where all my information, oh, in, all my improvisation, why can't I talk? Camille says, I'm having an issue where all my improvate. I've done it again. This is nuts. Improvisation. 
all my improvisation sounds the same. Any tips on shaking it up? Yes, Camel, I've got quite a few. I did I did a couple of live streams back. You'll be able to check it out. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry, dude. My mouth just wouldn't form that word. Improv was a good shortcut, but I can say improvisation. I don't know why I couldn't say it three times in a row. Okay, here's a my, here are my recommendations. But what I was going to say was about two or three weeks ago, I did a live stream about exactly that. <laughs> my guitar could do the talking. Well, it could do some talking. Uh, I don't know if it can say improvisation now. Um, all right. I think a lot of guitarists have this same issue about I'm playing the same licks just in different parts of the fretboard when I'm changing different keys or I just end up, you know, it sounds samey. The first thing you can do is start at the start. Now, people go, what? I started at the beginning of the bar. No, I don't mean start at the start. I mean, if you were a painter, and you were going to paint a massive canvas, you probably start with a small sketch or like a maybe a smaller canvas and paint the thing, and then you scale it up, right? If you were a writer, if you're going to write a best-selling novel, you don't just sit at the keyboard and bang it out. You have to, you have to have a an uh, an idea, a story arc. You understand what's going to happen in the story, the main characters. Okay, you have to have an outline of what you're going to do, and as a guitar player. Just like those other two creative people, you have to start with an idea you want to communicate. You don't. The writer doesn't put their fingers on the typewriter, typewriter, keyboard, and just, it doesn't just happen, okay? They need to have an understanding of what they're doing because they have an idea first and then go forward. So you need to have an idea. And by idea, I mean, if you're listening to, you've got a chord progression, you want to play a solo, you need to listen to the progression and then you need to do this thing that every good player does, which is they have a moment where they listen to that, absorb it, and then they start to sing or hum ideas that they have. Because the music's in here, right? It's not here. It starts here and then it travels to here and then it comes out of here, on here. But if you don't start at the start, if you don't start with them, uh, something that you create musically in your own creativity, and then translate that, then you're not starting at the start. So sing a musical idea, listen to the backing track, listen to the chords, let it go past. Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing, Kamel, is that again, you, um, you, you're going to the same things in the same places because you know they work and you feel comfortable there. Okay. For me, it was minor pentatonic shape one for years, like probably five or six years. That was just what I did because I didn't really know there was any other pentatonic shapes. And fingers have a way of finding places that they're comfortable with. Okay. The second reason that it sounds the same is because you're always going to those things because it's, there's a surety and a comfort to know that if you do those things, they will work. But let, let me just give you some math on this. Now there's 12 notes in music, okay? There's 12 notes on this guitar. There's some of them appear several times, but it's still only 12 notes. And for most songs, you'll be playing in a key and you, there's a scale that will work in that key and that scale has seven notes. Okay, so 12 notes in music, the scale that you want to be playing over your chord progression is seven of those 12 notes. Okay, so the, th the math lesson there is, even if you don't even look at your fretboard, make a random guess or play a completely random note on your fretboard, you will 58% of the time be hitting a correct, a correct note, a note that's in the scale of the key you're playing. Okay. Now, if you if you were told today you had a 58% chance of winning the lottery tonight, you'd already be gone down to the shop to buy your lottery tickets because the 58% chance is we feel good about those odds. 
so why don't we feel good about those odds when we go to play something on the guitar? doesn't matter where you start. You don't even have to look because more often than not, by quite some margin, you're going to hit a right note. That's the maths. Seven times out of 12, 58.3% of the time. You'll be sweet. All right. So be fearless. Don't rely on your comfort. Start playing from anywhere. It will take a bit of time and you will make some mistakes, but the maths is on your side. The probability is on your side. The other thing, and the other reason you should be fearless, Camille, is because if you do hit one of those outside notes, notes that aren't in your scale, you are only ever one fret away from a right note in the scale. So even if you hit a wrong note, you can bend it or you can slide it or you can make a feature of it. Slide up one fret or slide down one fret. But that's the only distance you really need to worry about is, is there. So two reasons to be fearless. You're only one fret away from a right note if you hit a wrong one. And 58.3% of the time, you're going to hit a right one anyway. So what's the big fear? Don't go to those comfortable positions. Maybe start somewhere else. But start at the start with a musical idea. Matthew, hey, how's it going? You just noticed the acoustic in the background. How often do you play acoustic? I've only seen you play electric. That's <laughs> that's true. I don't play acoustic that often. It's a beautiful guitar and I, well, I was just saying earlier, I just put some new strings on it because I've got a, a gig coming up with a singer songwriter who plays a lot of, she plays a lot of acoustic stuff. So I've got a get get kind of get my acoustic chops together but yeah you don't see me playing acoustic that much because i just generally prefer the electric and the artists i work with tend to be uh, you know tend to require electric players in fact for this for this gig it's it's only i think a 45 minute or, a, or an hour set but i'm having to take three guitars one standard electric probably this one um, this acoustic because there's some acoustic songs that have a second guitar and also the E flat tuned guitar, because there's this particular song that she does in E flat. So I need a different tuning. So I kind of, I, I can, I can imagine the looks from people when I arrive with three guitars and they're like, dude, it's 45 minutes. Why have you got three guitars? Why can't you just take one? Um, but those are, they're all necessary. I don't play it that often. So it's a nice, it's a nice Martin. And actually I worked with this particular singer songwriter a few years ago and I didn't have a very decent acoustic guitar. So I bought this one instead. And uh, it's, it's a nice piece. <laughs> So, yeah, it is, it's a nice, it's a Martin GPC, GPCPA5, man, they could have named that something a bit more friendly, like a Martin Tommy. Oh. And I have to get my fingers together because I'm play some Hendrix on there <laughs> because I'm a, I'm pretty terrible acoustic player I gotta say you know <laughs> hey Nick Nick from Cleveland hey man I really appreciate your time no problem no problem at all have you got any questions about practicing I've covered quite a lot in the last kind of 45 minutes but if you if you got anything else that you'd like my opinion on play some Hendrix what kind of Hendrix any tips on using chords in soloing Camel, yeah, I'll get to that. I tend to play electric more often. I had hand and wrist injuries and the electric is easier. Yeah, I just think I'm a bit of a worse, to be honest. Um, I did start a project with another singer specifically to get my acoustic chops together. Because what I like to do, I'm a bit of a sadist in that. If I have this idea, okay, look, I really need to get better at playing acoustic guitar. 
then I will put myself in a situation where I've got no other way out apart from to improve. So I started this project with this other singer and it was all acoustic stuff and I was playing and it was just me and there was nowhere to hide. So then we started gigging with that. And of course I, I needed to get better so we could do those shows. So I gave myself no way out. Sometimes it takes that kind of motivation to, to get me to pick this up. But um, it is lovely and I will be playing it a lot more over the next couple of weeks until we play the show. And then it'll probably go back in the case for another, I don't know, two or three months. Um, let's use it for recording sometimes, but I've been quite busy with other things lately. Okay, Camel, Camel's saying, any tips on using chords in soloing? Yes, absolutely. I never think about scales really i used to think about scales i used to ask myself what scale can i play over these chords because you want people um well i certainly started with a one size fits all type of thing right like i want one scale and i just want to know what that scale is and i can play over all those chords but that's it's a good place to start but it's a terrible place to stay because as you know notes in the scale sound good some notes sound good over some chords and then when that chord changes those notes don't sound as good anymore so nick you're thinking about machine gun by jimmy on the acoustic come on guys <laughs> okay um so yeah camel's question about soloing i always think about chords and there's the cage system and there's a bunch of other things that you can be using. But I think if you want to start from the ground up, number one is to understand the intervals or the scale degrees, their number. OK, if you've got a major scale, you just number the notes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and the octave or the one, the eight or the one. OK, the next step is to understand if you're playing like a bar chord like this, you need to understand what order those intervals or scale degrees come in that particular chord. OK, so this this is a root six bar chord. It's got its root on the sixth string and it's an, an E shape. And the order of the intervals, this is a one, this is a five, this is a one again, this is a three, this is a five. And this is a one. Okay, so once you know the order of the intervals, you also need to know the distance between any of those intervals and the next one above and below. So let me give you an example. <clears throat> um, this one is a one. Now, all the notes in the major scale are separated by two frets, apart from in two instances where they're only separated by one fret. Those two instances are between the three and the four and the seven and the eight. So everything else is just two frets. So if I'm here, if I'm playing this chord and I'm here and I know this is one, then I know that to get to the two, it's only two frets up, okay? So I've got another note to work with. I also know that the one can also be called the eight because it goes around in a cycle. When it gets to seven, it goes back to one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, stroke one, two, three, four, five, six, however you like to think about it. But because this is a one and be, or an eight, and between seven and eight is one fret, you know that if you move down one fret, that's a seven. So you now got, you know, the note above and you know the note below. So if you know that on every one of your strings in your chord, because you know what interval it is, then jumping beyond that camel, you get you get a way to to play certain things. You might not play all of it, but if you're here, you know that that's also one. So you know that you can go down to the seven. That's a three. So you can go up to the four because it's one fret. five so you've got six and before it's the four which is two frets away 
not that one. <coughs> Excuse me. That's a three, so that's a two. Three, four, two. Three, two. Three, four, two. One. <clears throat> so that's how I would approach it using chords and solos. <clears throat> You know, I think everybody, if you've been playing bar chords and you know open chords, that is enough to get you started playing some solo stuff, okay? Because I was, I was, I was um, working with a student the other day and we were just doing, I think, I think we were just doing E, B minor, and A. Okay, now there's an E here. We had B minor there, and there's a B minor there. <clears throat> And there's an A here, and there's an A here, and there's a couple of other A's. But if you just took that, those three chords and you, you just played through some changes, you went. Okay, you looking at me moving through single string, single note stuff. But actually here, I'm thinking about this E shape. This is the three, so this is the four, this is the five. This is the one. Three, four, five. And then here comes the B minor. The B minor looks like that. So I'm gonna go. Basically, play the top notes of those chords. And then the A is coming. So I'm going to hit that open E because E is in the A chord. And bend back up to that E. <clears throat> so play around with that. If you did use this E bar chord up here, you go. Then B minor. think it's that tricky even without knowing the cage shapes you got some you've got some shapes you can use right just your open E your root 5 E so set yourself a challenge and just either you can do it on the fly but I would definitely start by maybe just a piece of paper draw your fretboard and go okay for the e chord i'm going to try and hit this note just pick two notes and go these are the notes of the chord these are the chord tones i'm going to try for that one and that one at some point when the e chord is playing and then mark two for the second chord and mark two for the third chord and just get started with that now that was quite a lengthy answer, Camille. So I'm going to answer Nick's question. Nick from Cleveland, how do you go about practicing a lengthy song with difficult solos? Do you give yourself a time on or do you sit down and knock out as much as you can take until next time? That's a great question. <clears throat> um, it really depends on why I'm learning it. Am I learning it for me or am I learning it because I need to go and play a show with somebody who's asked me to learn it? And it depends on how much time I've got. But um, I talked about this in a live stream, I think, last week, because we were talking about learning songs fast. So um, if you want um, like a whole hour devoted to learning songs fast and techniques I use and can recommend, then go back and check that one out. Nick, it's last week's one. But generally, I, I practice a lengthy song in units modules okay um i i'll sit with the verse i mean i'm sure if it's you know most of the songs i play with when i go and gig are, are songs with singing so there's vocal it's not instrumental music it's not like satriani or vice stuff and it's definitely not you know 12 minute prog rock 
things. So if I'm working on a song, there's a verse bridge in the chorus, then I'll spend some time learning the verse and, and being happy with that, being happy with how, the chords, the rhythm, all of that stuff. Next, I'm going to then move to the chorus. And the important thing once you learn these modules is to is to practice the transition between module the first module and the second module okay because it's the transition when your brain goes um what is it we're doing again because we were doing the chorus we were doing the verse now we've got good go chorus there's a bit of a pause so if you play like the last half a bar of the of the verse into the chorus then you're kind of helping smooth that transition <clears throat> um I've got to go pretty soon, but like I said, Nick, if you want to have a look at lots more of that stuff, just check out the Learning Songs Fast live stream from last week. Nick also asks, do you have any, um, do you have any techniques for making Jimmy and Stevie songs easier to learn? Probably no more than what you hear everybody else say, which is take it slowly take your time and don't expect too much too soon you know a lot of people want want you know in a week's time to be playing Riviera Paradise by Stevie Ray Vaughan okay Stevie could do that but we can't because we're mere mortals right so take it slowly practice it at a tempo you can think to communicate fast enough to your fingers so they don't stuff up we already talked about that um and if you've got something like amazing slow downer or you can put YouTube, you click the cog icon and put it on half speed, or there's another app called AnyTune where you can slow things down and EQ things and filter out other frequencies so you can just hear the part that you want, definitely do that. And also last week I talked about transcribing and the process of transcribing actually helps solidify what you've learned much better than just if you learned it off a tab because you're making your own transcription and you're focusing on listening it helps sync it in the memory much faster <clears throat> all right nick good i'm glad that's useful joel oh joe very good explanation having a plan setting goals having an organized practice session recording progress and ending with the fun stuff good advice yeah well it works for me it might not work for everybody but that's it's taken me a long time to develop that as a as a structure and a framework to, to how I practice. But I'm kind of glad I did because there's nothing worse than spending an hour with your guitar aimlessly needling, coming out of that, feeling like you didn't achieve anything, right? Okay, the song that took me longest to learn. It was probably a Jimmy song because I had to learn two and a half hours of Hendrix material. Um <clears throat> I'll tell you, I'll tell you the song. I know exactly what it is because it took me three months to learn. And it was a very ambitious thing to do for the Hendrix project. And the guys weren't that keen when I suggested we do it, but it was something I had to do. It was 1983, a merman I should turn to be. Okay, in its entirety. I can't remember how long it is. It might be 15 or 16 minutes with several kind of chapters, several kind of movements. But if you find that song by Jimi Hendrix on Electric Ladyland, you'll see that there's lots of stuff going on there. And we had, it's not that the playing is complex, it's that there's lots of free time bits and kind of atmospherics and trippy stuff that was never performed live. It was just created in the studio. But that, um, trying to work out what things would cue other things was um, a massive challenge. But we did play it live and, um, it came together really well. I was very pleased on the night, but you know, if you practice something for 121 days, those are the kind of results you're going to get. Okay. You just got to put the hours in. All right, Matthew, Nick, Camel, um, Joe, and all of the other dudes here. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you found that useful. You can continue dropping comments in the live chat. Um, or comments under this video if you're watching the replay, if you'd like any other topics covered, you'd like me to talk about giving you advice on anything else you're struggling with, then if you can't access the live chat after this live broadcast, then drop it in the comment below. 
and um, we'll take a look at it. Uh, so thank you very much for your time this afternoon, this evening, this morning, wherever you are in the world. And um, I'm going to hop off now and um, go do some other things. So take it easy, everybody. And I hope you make your practice useful. And what's the other word? Useful. And I will just I hope it's useful and fruitful. That's what I was going to say. All right, guys. Bye for now. See ya.